Hi. <coughs> excuse me, sorry. You're going to have to excuse my gravelly voice and um, the odd cough. I'm, I'm getting over a bit of a head cold, which is something possibly many of you here today can relate to. It's a fact, isn't it? Sickness and ill health, it's a part of life. And I guess as a consequence, we're probably all interested, probably to varying degrees, in how we, how we manage our health and how we prevent sickness, which brings me nicely to what I want to talk to you about today, which is the different ways that we treat and understand common illnesses, such as a head cold, and the medicines and medical practices that are available to us currently in our public health system in New Zealand. I think we all know that there are different ways of understanding and treating disease. The different understandings, particularly of the origins of disease, have arisen throughout history. Some have been completely abandoned, while new insights and understandings are being made every day. Some medicines and medical practices have arguably been ascribed more value than others. For example, in typical Western societies, medicines that have been proved scientifically to work are often considered by many to be the most valuable. However, even the other medicines, the so-called alternatives, those that can't be easily scientifically tested and, and proved to work, are used by patients and practitioners in this country and overseas every single day. And in fact, if we look at patient and consumer behaviour, the use of these so-called alternatives is on the rise. So, should we be looking at managing the use of these so-called alternative medicines and practices? And should we be looking at providing them within our current public health system, which at the moment favours and is dominated by scientifically proved medicines and practices? Before I discuss this, I want to reflect just briefly on the different ways that we understand and treat illness. And I'll go back to my head cold. I woke up a week and a half ago feeling dreadful. I had a stuffed head, a blocked nose, a sore throat, and I thought I should stay in bed for the day. And I should have stayed in bed for the day, but then I remembered those five reports I had sitting in the corner of my desk and I dragged myself into work. As I walked past reception, I sneezed, and the man sitting behind the desk blessed me. As I walked to my desk, I stopped to talk to a colleague, and she recommended I went home and drank lemon and honey drinks till they came out of my ears. When I sat down at my desk, the woman across from me threw me a packet of Sudafed and warned me to stay away. When I got home that night, my son made me an echinacea and raspberry leaf tea. In the course of one day, I had been offered four different medical treatments for the same affliction four different medical treatments for the same symptoms, four different medical treatments that you could argue stem from a different way of looking at that same illness. The man who blessed me was probably quite un unaware he was trying to treat me with a possible cure that dates back the longest. Saying bless you to me after I sneezed was desi designed, according to many, to squish my soul back into my body or expel the demons that were causing disease. Disease and ill health have been inextricably linked to supernatural understandings or religion for centuries. And in fact, it wasn't until the 16th, 16th century that monasteries were replaced as centres of learning by medical universities and practitioners of all varieties. The woman who threw the Sudafed at me was both promoting a modern medical breakthrough, the isolation of a popular plant alkaloid, while she was perpetuating a theory that was first proposed in the 16th century. 16th century was big for medicine, by the way. Girolamo Fragastoro was among the first to propose contagion theory, and he suggested that disease was spread by a form of pathological pollination spread by imperceptibly small particles capable of reproducing themselves and invisible to the naked eye. By the 17th century, the invention of the microscope illuminated Fragastoro's tiny world of microorganisms, seemingly proving his theory. The echinacea and raspberry leaf tea and the lemon and honey drinks were both treatments based on centuries of use of medicinal plants. The way that these plants have been used has changed dramatically over time, 
the plant-based drugs that doctors prescribe today little resemble the raw material and plants that doctors were prescribing in this country 100 years ago. Because all these treatments were available to me, I took them all. Why not? Maybe one or two or perhaps a combination of them worked. I don't know. I certainly felt better in the morning. Some of you here, I know, will tell me it was a Sudafed. The pseudoephedrine manufactured under exacting standards in an international pharmaceutical lab will trump the so-called old woman's remedies every time, you'll tell me. Some of you here may have read the growing body of literature on manuka honey and think that did the trick. Others here might be advocates of herbal medicines, or some of you will simply be sitting there saying, you feel better, what does it matter, what's your point? My point is that as committed and dedicated as we remain to our notion of science, particularly in Western societies and cultures, it seems we still use a broad range of criteria to assess the medicines we use to treat ourselves and our families. The main one being, perhaps, does it make me feel better? So I want to return and expand on my original question. Should our public health system be similarly extending its criteria when looking at the medicines it subsidises? Should we consider subsidising or funding previously unfunded medicines, medicines that can't be proved scientifically to work easily, and integrate them into a system that is dominated by scientifically proved medicine? And if we do so, how do we assess and manage the use of these medicines so it's safe and effective? I guess, first of all, we need to ask, do we really need to? Do we really need these alternatives? In the 1940s, the first mass-produced anti-malarial and anti-tubicular drugs were produced. In the 50s and 60s, we had drugs for contraception, mental illness, cardiovascular disease, most known infectious diseases. In fact, most people agree by the 1970s, drugs existed for most known diseases. So do we really need an alternative to the scientifically proved armory? Let me put this to you. Just because we produce a vast number of drugs globally each year does not mean that the people who need them are getting them. In 1999, the Global Forum for Health Research highlighted the fact that 90% of the drugs manufactured worldwide each year by value are consumed by 15% of the world's population. Put bluntly, the medicines market is dominated by lifestyle drugs for the rich at the health needs and expenses of the poor. In New Zealand, our medicine choice is largely dictated by Pharmac, a government organisation which assess and determine which drugs are funded and subsidised. Patients and practitioners can access alternatives, however these are rarely subsidised, they're often extremely costly, and avenues to their access are arguably tedious and often time consuming. Let's talk efficacy. Don't worry. I'm not going to stand here and debate the efficacy of certain drugs. I'll leave that to the drug reps. They're good at that. But what I do want to suggest, and I think it's safe to say, that every single person in this room knows of someone, or perhaps knows of someone who knows of someone, for whom the prescribed drug or treatment for their specific condition or disease did not work. Not only did it not work, it exacerbated the situation. It made things worse. Despite all our understandings, despite all the amazing advances of modern medicine, there remain the exceptions and the individual reactions and responses which personally, I believe, make the provision of alternative treatments something at least worth investigating. Putting aside the economics of the endeavour, which takes someone far more qualified than I to discuss, the burning question that remains is how. How do we assess these treatments and medicines that can't be easily tested scientifically and integrate them in a system which is governed by scientific testing and assessment? And how do we do so so that the use of these medicines is safe and effective? If we agree that every medicine subsidised by the state needs to go through some form of assessment, we could use existing regimes and protocols. We could remain committed to our notion of science. We could, for example, isolate the individual constituents in herbal medicines, test them in a laboratory, 
or we could use randomised clinical trials to determine whether, say, homeopath homeopathy works for one group of people as opposed to another. However, these regimes and protocols may not be appropriate for every treatment, or they may not encompass every aspect of a certain treatment. For example, the use of herbal medicines by traditional healers often involves the use of prayer or karakia, an element not so easily scientifically tested or, or assayed, and one that many people agree shouldn't be so readily dismissed. Randomised clinical trials rely on the fact you're testing a group of individuals who have been diagnosed with the same condition or disease. However, diagnosis by an alternative practitioner is often far more complex. It involves multiple sites in the body often, and it's rarely the same among individuals. Putting aside the practical challenges, one may argue that making every medicine or medical treatment or procedure meet the same exacting scientific standards denies the existence of alternative views on health and wellness. And regardless of whether we believe in them or not, human rights, not necessarily modern medical ethics, but human rights dictate that those people who do believe in those alternative views have the right to do so. So what are our other options? We could use different evidence to assess the safety and efficacy of medicine. We could expand our notion of evidence-based medicine. In New Zealand currently, the Ministry of Health is undergoing a consultation process around the regulation of natural health products, and it's proposing a new set of evidence for regulation, traditional and historic use. The use of this evidence is based on one huge premise, and that is, if a treatment or medicine has been used for centuries, it is therefore safe and effective. This is a huge presumption, and one that I suspect is too big for many. However, it does open the doors for debate and discussion around the use of indigenous Māori medicine in New Zealand today. I've literally just scratched the surface of this subject, much like the vast amount of literature that explores the integration of complementary and alternative medicines into mainstream medical systems. Ultimately, it seems that while we are quite ready to use a broad range of criteria to assess the medicines we use on ourselves and our families, when it comes to bu public health, we are understandably more cautious and reluctant to relinquish our dedication and commitment to scientific testing and assessment. This is not a bad thing. However, perhaps it's time we expand our notion on health, health and wellness. Perhaps it's time we look outside of our country for examples of systems that do integrate these so-called alternatives safely and effectively. And we learn to manage and embrace the ever-growing use of alternative medicines in New Zealand. So please, next time you get a head cold, I want you to think about the treatment you reach for. Is that a treatment available to everyone? Or does society's perception of that treatment mean that only those people with enough money in their pocket to afford it can access it and use it? 